Hello, everyone. My name is Kimberly McDonald, and I'm the Senior Manager of Academic Programs for Design at CCA. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over some logistics. First, I'd like to show you where the Q&A feature is located on the bottom of your screen. Please use this feature to ask your questions. We may not be able to get to them all, so please be sure to upvote any questions you'd like answered first. Additionally, closed captioning is available during the webinar. Next to Q&A, you should see a button that says Live Transcript. Click the up arrow to show subtitles, open a full transcript, or edit the size of your subtitles. If you have any trouble with this feature, please use the chat and someone on our staff can help you out. Finally, Chris Lasher, the Program Manager for MFA Design, will be putting our community agreement into the chat. Please take a moment to read it before we begin, and now I'll hand it over to Helen Maria Nugent. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Chris. Hi, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, as it says right here, I'm Helen Marie Nugent. I'm the Dean of the Design Division here at California College of the Arts in San Francisco. And um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for the fifth of seven events in our 2021 design lecture series. And tonight we've got the pleasure of hearing from Maki Suzuki of the Graphic Design Collective Obaki. Um, design at CCA is a sanctuary for those with radical curiosity, a place where your wonder and your imagination are amplified through rigorous experimentation and deep craft. Our purpose is to equip makers, thinkers and doers with the wherewithal to envision alternate futures and the creative capacity to deliver generative solutions and inspire change. In partnership with our colleagues in fine arts, architecture and the humanities, we make art and design that matters. The division, as you can see, we are a uh, host to six undergraduate programs, fashion, furniture, graphics, illustration, industrial and interaction design, and at the graduate level, the MFA design, the MBA in design strategy, and an MDES in interaction design. Our campuses are located in Hui Chin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of the Chachenyo and Ramayatush Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. CCA honors Indigenous peoples, past, present and future, here and around the world, and we wish to pay our respects to our local elders with this land acknowledgement. Uh, please mark your calendars for our next event uh, coming up on March 11th. It's sponsored by Critical Ethnic Studies in collaboration with our Furniture Design Program. And you will be hearing from Jomo Tariko, who's an Ethiopian furniture designer, who will present uh, his perspective on African-based modern furniture. Please join us. Our lectures all semester, uh, so we've got two more coming up after this one, are all leading practitioners whose work is reshaping our world and I invite you to join us for all of these critical conversations. Heartfelt thanks go out to Chilean graphic designer Alejandra Valenzuela. She's a graduate of our MFA in design program and she created all the graphics that you saw in the intro sequence and the branding for this lecture series. She calls this concept the electricity of the idea raised dot stitches representing all sensations and connections generated when creating. And thank you again to Kimberly and Chris for all their work behind the scenes tonight to make this a reality. Um, can I ask Mackie and John to turn their videos on, please? Hello. Hi, hi, lovely, lovely to see you both. Um, it's really great to have you here, Mackie, all the way from London. Um, first, let me quickly introduce John Sueda. Uh, he's the chair of the MFA Design Program and the sponsor of tonight's lecture. Thank you so much for inviting Maki Suzuki to be with us. Uh, John's originally from Hawaii and has, a pra and has practiced everywhere from Honolulu to Holland. He's the founder of design studio Stripe, uh, specializing in print and exhibition design for art and culture. Um, in 2007, he relocated to San Francisco where he served as the director of the uh, the, the Director of Design for the CCA Waters Institute for Contemporary Arts. And lucky for us, in 2014, he became chair of our uh, very established and wonderful MFA design program. Um, John's creative practice includes curating exhibitions, writing, and independent publishing. And you're going to see a lot of connections tonight and why he's bringing 
Maki Suzuki here. So I'm going to hand it over to you two. Thank you again so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to your lecture. Take it away, John. Maki. Thank you, Helen Maria. And thank you, Kimberly and Chris, for all your work on this uh, event. Um, thank you very much for joining us here tonight. I'm going to do a short intro for Maki. Um, Alternative realities, fiction, and parallel universes might seem like a misnomer when it comes to describing the work of graphic designers, especially those who see the discipline as a vehicle toward invisibly bringing function and clarity to a client's content. In their exhibition, Which Mirror Do You Want to Lick? The design collective Abake, in, in collaboration with co-curators Sophie Dederen and Radim Pesco, create an exhibition that interrogates this illusion of truth. The show constantly casts doubt on where you are, what you know, and who you, who you think we are as a society. The exhibition first launched at the 27th International Graphic Design Biennial in Brno, the Czech Republic, in June of 2016. They ended their press release with this open-ended statement. We are surrounded by evidence that we are living in an alternative reality of someone else. Fast forward to a very near future. You're looking at the French front page of a newspaper. President Trump shakes hands with French President Marine Le Pen. Not so funny now, is it? None of us imagined that just a few months later, we would literally enter a new dimension of post truth politics, alternative facts, and fake news. Today, we're so lucky to have with us Maki Suzuki of the legendary design collective Abake who will take us down the rabbit hole of this exhibition that has since traveled to Nice, Casterly, Melbourne, where it was canceled due to the pandemic, and next Tokyo. Although I've been a huge fan of Abake for almost 20 years, they are still a mystery to me in many ways. I'm still not sure if I'm pronouncing their name properly and Maki will never tell me for sure. Although before this lecture, he explained to us that the pro proper pronunciation is Orbeka. What I do know is Abake is a transdisciplinary collective of four graphic designers, Patrick Lacey, Kaija Stahl, Benjamin Riken, and Maki, who all met during their master's studies in communication art and design at the Royal College of Art in, and started their studio in the summer of 2000. Their practice spans many areas beyond a traditional graphic design studio. They're founders of Sexy Machinery Magazine, Kitsune, a, re a record label, and Dent de Leon, a publishing house. Much of their work concentrates on the social aspect of art and design, often involving happenings, workshops that may include dancing, eating, and cooking. Abake has collaborated with artists like Ryan Gander, Max Lamb, Joanna Billing, and worked with and exhibited in institutions like the Design Museum, Victoria Albert Museum, and the Serpentine Gallery. They've worked with musicians like the Cardigans and Daft Punk, and designers like Martin Margiela and Hussein Chalayan. This amazing list of partnerships speaks to Abake's unique ability to engage with creativity without boundaries and constantly expand the possibilities of design practice. Maki was nice enough to stay up late so he could be with us live from the UK where it's 2, 2 a.m. So I'm very happy to introduce to you Maki Suzuki of Abake. Thank you, John. Thank you, Helen Maria. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you to CCA. Um, well, thank you very much for the for the introduction. Um, as for the pronunciation of our name, um, because it's a Swedish name, I, I am <clears throat> myself or uh, the other two non-Swedes of the uh, collective, not even that uh, qualified to to tell anyone how it's pronounced. So doesn't really matter. I guess uh, each new pronunciation is, uh, is, um, is an exciting moment for us. I have a question for everyone, which is, can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Which mirror do you want to lick? Is uh, something that we've been wondering 
since um, 2016. And um, that's a question that came uh, between uh, different conversations. Uh, in fact, it also including uh, John, um, but more specifically with uh, Radin Pesco, who um, is a graphic designer, um, maybe quite well known for his type foundry uh, and um, type foundry and factory of one. Um, and Sophie Dederen, who uh, at the time of the first discussion were, was a, the director of uh, Franz Mazarel Centrum, a uh, graphic arts um, uh, art center in, I was gonna say the north of Belgium, like sort of northeast, I think, if I remember correctly. So this project is, uh, is an exhibition project and has uh, since traveled. Um, it's, it's, it was conceived, I guess it was conceived in Belgium and, and London uh, in terms of discussions, but the first time it uh, took place was in Brno in the Czech Republic. Uh, then it traveled to Nice in France, then to Castellet in Belgium, then to Melbourne, then uh, there was a discussion for a version to go to Minneapolis, uh, but that didn't happen. Then to Tokyo, which then didn't happen. Uh, it was supposed to be in October 2020, but um, as some of you may know, uh, there were some events that uh, prevented this to happen. Then the discussion about going to Tokyo happened again. Uh, not later than uh, a few weeks ago. So we hope that it goes to Tokyo. And uh, in parallel, the discussion of uh, going to Kyoto with it um, is, uh, is being discussed right now. In terms of the timeline, started in 2016, then 2017 in France, 2019, um, in Belgium, 2020. There might be a 2020, an extra 2020 there, but you know, we, we never know in 2020. So the subject of the uh, of the exhibition, I think, um, I don't I don't necessarily have to say too much about it because John uh, introduced it quite well in the sense that um, the the exhibition to to. The way I explain it usually, or the way uh, Radim or, or Sophie explained it, actually, I don't, I don't quite know their alternative ways of uh, uh, telling about the exhibition. But I, um, I always say that it's a, it's an exhibition with the uh, which presents or uh, represents the some of the evidence that there is uh, that there are alternative realities, and. Um, here, the, uh, because the exhibition is traveling from one place to another, it also is the opportunity for itself to become its own alternative reality or alternative version of it. And um, the, the context is, is changing. So before, the reason why I was showing you the dates is because I think you probably, we all probably remember that 2016 was very different than 2020. In fact, there are so many events since then that um, you could uh, show exactly, probably show exactly the same exhibition within the same uh, space, same mediation, same uh, communication, and it would be understood in, uh, you know, in a completely different, uh, different way. Here, each venue was uh, completely different in terms of uh, the, the context, well, not as different as to being something else than an exhibition, but let's say that a graphic design biennial where uh, there are um, maybe five, five or six different exhibi big exhibitions and um, events, talks, workshops, etc., uh, which animates the, the town of, uh, of Brno, uh, at least within the light of graphic design for, I think, three months, something like this is very different from a contemporary art center in the south of France, 
which in itself is very different from a graphic art center in Belgium, which in itself is very different from a design week in, uh, in Melbourne, uh, which itself is yes, a website, which actually didn't happen, but, um, but we discussed it. And in the near future, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, in an art college, and later a um, printing company gallery. For one, um, I think the fact that the language changes is uh, it was a bigger factor than we anticipated, uh, you know, from Czech to, I think the common language we, we use between Radim, uh, Sophie and I is English and I, I live in London, Radim lives in London, uh, Sophie lives in, uh, in Belgium, but English is not our first language. So already there, there is, uh, this seems to reflect that uh, in the Western world, at least there is an alternative reality, which is that English seems to be the common language, a bit like the, uh, the common language in, the, in Lord of the Rings. Uh, Lords of the, Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings. In Lord of the Rings, where uh, they have a common language, which uh, all the different uh, factions and races seem to be talking. But every now and then, you know, the elves talk, uh, speak in, in Elvish. And this translation uh, from space and time uh, also happened within the, um, well, we had to reflect this um, in the title, which started as, which mirror do you want to lick? And maybe I'll just talk about the, the French one, which is, a version that is uh, completely different from the other ones, which are, uh, you know, it's not a translation, but it's, uh, in a way, it's a real translation in terms of interpretation. So there, there was a discussion with the, uh, our co-curator in France, who he, he really couldn't. He liked the exhibition, but he, he hated the, the title. Or it's not so much that he hated it, but he just uh, he just constantly said that he doesn't he didn't understand it. He didn't understand what it meant uh, when it was translated in French. Um, I am a French speaker, and I could understand it, but what I could understand is that in order for it to uh, to be transformed through this co-curation with someone else, then we had to agree about this. And um, yeah, and somehow the, that's the first time that it moved from one place to another. And we, we understood that the more different or the most different it could be, the better it, uh, you, you know, the exhibition would become. So la doubleur means uh, the, uh, the doppelganger or the, uh, also means the lining of a, of a jacket. Uh, it means the double, and uh, so essentially, it is. It is very similar, but um, but different. So here, um, it's the list of people. So SD stands for Sophie Dederen and uh, RP uh, Radim Pesco. It's for one, two, three, and perhaps also the one in Kyoto, there will be different co-curators because we, uh, let's say that to, to, to go very quickly on the, on the exhibition and the way it changes. Um, I think it's probably two thirds of, of the show that uh, is the same. It travels, the, or at least the artifact travels or somehow at least the ideas travel. And, um, and then there are new elements that are either left behind, um, well, left behind in the Czech Republic, left behind in France, etc., but where we confront this idea of, you know, the proof of uh, alternative realities uh, within arts, design, objects, um, to be, to be exhibited um, specifically because of the context. So somehow the uh, the exhibition itself is uh, is in a way openly not political, 
it is just that it came at a moment when um, coincidentally in Brno in 2016, uh, the primaries were happening in the US. And uh, of course, the most alternative reality, uh, reality then was that um, someone uh, came out, not exactly from nowhere in the States, but um, not from the usual political uh, background and was uh, shaking the situation, which I guess at the time when, the, when it opened, we were just, uh, it was more of a joke, I guess. Fast forward, I think we all know what happened. Um, but in Nice, uh, also coincidentally, the, the second round of the French presidential election was happening in uh, 2017. Then uh, in Castellet, it coincided with the, um, uh, the federal and regional elections in Belgium. But somehow the opening was moved because the, uh, the, not the director who is Sophie, but above her in the administration decided that it shouldn't coincide with, the, uh, with that event. 2020, I think we all know what uh, happened as also 2020 seems to be continuing now in 21. And um, yeah, I guess the Japanese general election will also happen. Uh, this again is a coincidence, but it just seems that um, it, it sort of calls for it. For some reason, you know, it, uh, even though there are 365 days uh, in the year, the, uh, there is always uh, some kind of event in the, in the place where the, the exhibition is shown. Now, in terms of the mediation, um, this also is uh, another comparison of uh, how different the mediation and uh, the captioning was uh, treated. The first one, uh, we had more than 150 captions. So uh, we also captioned artworks that were within artworks. Then in Nice, we didn't have any captions, but we, um, we had uh, performers who, who knew pretty much uh, the stories of uh, every single object and would be accompanying visitors to talk about it. Then in Belgium, there were no captions at all. In fact, all the captions of the, the first uh, iteration were actually shown as an, as an artwork. And, uh, and then in Melbourne, because it was the design, the design week, I think the, um, there was a focus on the fact that because it was surrounded by uh, all the different events and shops and um, uh, presenting, I guess, primarily furniture, as it happens in, uh, um, all around the world when they call uh, a week, a design week, we had a little booklet and also the everything was on sale or at least uh, it had a price to reflect the, the context. So in Brno, we, you were uh, confronted first to this uh, sculpture. It was both a sculpture, but also the, the container for the whole show. I don't know if you can see the scale. It's, it's uh, I would say it is uh, five meters, 4.5 4 meters, something like this high. And uh, there are crates uh, usually for fruits. But, and so they're, they're quite uh, strong crates. And these ones are quite um, special in the sense that they were created over um, a few months um, by mixing different colors, which uh, usually doesn't happen. View of the exhibition. So you can see the poster for the um, Olympic Games in Finland in 1940. And that's usually the, 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 one, uh, the one artwork that um, I use in my example of you know, how to describe the exhibition. It is a poster that, uh, so this one is, uh, is borrowed from the Olympic Museum in Lausanne. Uh, so it's an original, uh, incredibly the, the, the orange at the bottom is fluorescent, uh, but it is from the time 
And uh, so I don't know what kind of uh, conservation techniques they have, but it's uh, top. I mean, it's in Switzerland. So. And, um, and I use this one because the fact that a poster is announcing uh, some, an event is also, uh, as time goes by, the, the proof that the event uh, happened. The thing is that um, in 1940, they, they canceled the Olympics because of, uh, because of the war, the Second World War. And somehow this, uh, this artifact suddenly becomes, um, it, it is actually quite strange to talk about this because uh, uh, this case seemed to be quite unique or, or at least um, uh, noticeable because it's uh, um, you don't have a second world war all the time but i guess a lot of uh, a lot of posters have been created um, in 2020 that uh, then for aliens who would probably visit us um, will be the proof of uh, quite a lot of non-existent events so good luck with that aliens there are uh, yeah pieces of furniture made possibly by uh, Francis Bacon, who would have never taken on painting. There are flags for co existing countries, but uh, alternative flags, alternative, um, alternative events, alternative uh, sizes, standards, uh, alternative um, a supermarket. Uh, so this was more specific to the Czech Republic alternative uh, airline companies, uh, alternative um, architecture for the computer center, alternative uh, rock band, alternative movies um, uh, existing in books, uh, alternative uh, authors. Um, maybe this project uh, bottom right, uh, it shows uh, the books that um, so it's a, it's a project by Mariana Castillo de Val, and uh, she asked friends and uh, and non friends, but um, authors, artists, uh, philosophers, and people from different uh, you know, neighboring fields. But, uh, I guess there is always an element of writing. So she she asked them to imagine a book that uh, they I think that they would write themselves more than they would imagine could exist, and. Um, and she created all those dust covers, uh, so covers and, uh, and sometimes a blurb, sometimes not about this book. I think it's, it's uh, primarily to, as a positive push towards making them, uh, to realize them, either by the people who imagined them or, or, or maybe, you know, tempting fate for the books to eventually happen. There were also, so the, the exhibition shows um, objects, I guess. Uh, sometimes they can be called sculptures if they are in a contemporary art situation, but really they are objects um, and they are either from art or from design. But what's interesting in a way is how a, an object that is designed can be seen as a graphic design object if it's in a design biennial, but, but if it is shown, let's say a poster here, you know, in the background, you have a, a three versions of a Musha uh, poster cropped in different ways, framed in different ways, um, they aged in different ways. They become, uh, they are not exactly graphic design posters if shown in a graphic design, in a, in a contemporary art exhibition. They are, uh, they are artifacts, I guess. They are not considered artworks either. And this perception is something that uh, we were very happy to explore. money uh, money proposals but also beyond uh, proposals they they sometimes were uh, I mean fully fully paid fully um, the, the one on the left is the is a federal competition for uh, the Swiss banknotes um, 
which was won by Norm, and uh, it was actually completed in terms of the design and was going through production, but it was halted for, for some reasons, unforeseen reasons. business cards for Francis Bacon. Uh, the, the business cards themselves are produced for the exhibition and therefore are new, but the design itself is, uh, was designed by Francis Bacon. We just cleaned it up. Um, So in terms of the books, um, it's also the, you know, the confrontation of existing books. Uh, for instance, um, here what we see is a few examples of commissions uh, that are of the Grasshopper Lies Heavy by uh, Horton uh, Abenson, who is the author in uh, Philip K. Dick's um, uh, The Man from the High Castle. And within um, Philip K. Dick's book, uh, the characters are looking for this uh, other book that shows an alternative reality. And, um, and that alternative reality is not even the one that we are living in, but within which uh, the, uh, the Allies have won the Second World War. So yes, yeah, sorry, the, the book in Philip K. Dick, in the book by Philip K. Dick, the, uh, the Axis um, won the war. So this one is interesting to, to maybe talk a little bit about because um, Sophie is probably the only uh, actual curator uh, or but she's, she's not even, um, she claims that she wasn't even, um, she didn't even study curatorship. Uh, but she does curate exhibitions for, for that's, that's her job apart from being a director of an institution, of an art institution. But, um, but Radim and, and I, we are not really, um, I, I guess, bound by some, uh, some, uh, I would say um, ethical rules that comes with uh, an education within curatorship or curation. So for instance, we were very interested by uh, an artwork by uh, Ryan Gander, who was uh, considering a Joy Division record sleeve and um, uh, which used a typeface and he created the sort of a counterpoint of this typeface so that it, it, it's more legible uh, well, it's a, it's a Wim Crowell um, typeface. The point is, I mean, that's a, an, almost another story. We asked him whether we could create these, which are a continuation of the, the work we think he made. And um, with his blessing, we just made those records using his typeface, but creating those little blocks and, uh, and also uh, printing the, um, the records. And it is uh, attributed to him. So it is now part of, uh, I mean, that's his work. He titled it, but somehow the idea came from somewhere else, which we thought was uh, an, an interesting alternative way of uh, maybe authorship in this case. The um, yeah, paper size, um, I guess when you think about it, paper size and all the, the this kind of standard, um, if you think quite deeply and uh, at length, it's almost quite frightening how uh, everything is um, somehow subject can be subjectively um, imposed on us. And um, and here there it is a project by Gemma Holt, and she chose to have a different kind of uh, paper standard. But I suppose then uh, you have a new uh, palette then maybe you have a new truck, then you have, if the trucks are bigger, then maybe can the road, should the road be bigger and etc. So it could, uh, it could really change the world. Um, it has changed uh, our world in OBK and our publishing company because um, half the books that we now design use this 
um, unbeknownst to the uh, to the the people we work with, um, we use the, the this format. So I can't quite see the clock. So um, can you tell me if I'm uh, doing okay? Because I have three more exhibitions <laughs> for which I won't be saying as much, I guess, but just the differences. Hi, Maki. We got about 15 minutes until you want to do some Q&As. Okay. So this is the, uh, the French one where we, it's in this beautiful contemporary art center. And in this one, there were uh, invigilators, but they were performers. So they, they, had to, um, they had to learn all the different stories. And instead of the captions that you could read, uh, they would be with you and telling you stories of whatever you were interested in. And we built the walls. Um, not sure if you can see it, but there is a little window on each of the walls. And if you look through them, there were other exhibitions. So here you see that um, you can see this sculpture. And this is a view from the other exhibition, the alternative exhibition for which there was no real communication, but, um, but there was a, uh, a poster or a billboard in fact, uh, in the garden with the same date, different, um, uh, different title and also different author. It is the production director of the, uh, of the place who, to whom we gave a, uh, carte blanche of um, making his own exhibition because he uh, was he's basically the the memory of the place he, he was a student there when it opened and then uh, and then never left uh, he's he's legendary um, he's known all over France for being the the best of the best uh, once Paul McCarthy himself wanted to um, just hire him after an exhibition there he really hesitated to move to California, but, uh, but then stayed. So there was a possibility to look at the alternative exhibitions. Lots of collaborations with, um, so in this case, yeah, with, the, with the invigilators who, um, who were encouraged to come with the, their alternative um, occupations. Here is a bit of a segue to, I'll try to be as fast as possible. It was a workshop with, at the Rietveld Academy and we had in mind to give uh, the assignment uh, based on a book by uh, Stanislaw Lem, where he wrote all the reviews of books that uh, he probably wanted to write but never, never got to, to do so. Or maybe it was this intellectual uh, uh, and funny exercise. I mean, it's funny, but he actually did it. It's, a, it's an extraordinary book, a compilation of uh, reviews of books that don't exist. So we just gave the reviews to the students and to imagine what the book was, but they didn't know that the books didn't exist. And uh, that was a very fun uh, production heavy week. I think that the deal for us was that we worked with the Rietveld Library in Amsterdam uh, so that the, the resulting books, so they had to produce three of each, uh, would be then, one of them would be then uh, um, joining the library. And with uh, this reading sheet, uh, you, could, um, you, could, you could go there now and, uh, and recreate the exhibition. So it's um, how to make a permanent exhibition in a, in a space and how to transform artworks that are um, dormant and are, uh, I guess, books in libraries. In Belgium, there were new so a new stool was created 
every place. We also included, um, whenever there was a review, and uh, there were quite a few in France, whenever they, in the, in the review of the exhibitions, they would always mention, oh yeah, but they, they should have shown this, or they should have shown that. What we did is that we just uh, got all the reviews, and for the next one in Belgium, we added the artworks that they mentioned. Um, in the Franz Masuel Centrum, I'll, uh, if you have never been there, I think you, you should. It's, a, it's quite an extraordinary place. It actually looks like uh, California somehow in my, in my mind. In Melbourne, um, it was not really... Well, it was not possible with the budget to transport everything. So uh, one way that we well, we edited down the uh, the exhibition, but also we sent uh, printouts or we sent digital file, and um, that created another uh, yet another reality. Obviously, the fact that it happened in the uh, early so the opening was supposed to be I. I think I remember the 18th of uh, the 18th of March 2020. Um, the 16th of March, uh, the, our co-curator Brad Haylock from um, well from Melbourne. Uh, just uh, I think he he's he's the sweetest guy. But uh, on this one occasion, I think he ordered us to buy uh, another flight back to Europe. For Sophie and I, and uh, yeah, the 16th of March 2020, I came back to London. Sophie went back to Belgium, and I think three days later it was locked down. Um, 16th of March, but also 16 people uh, saw the exhibition before it was uh, shut down. This is somehow how it is at the moment. It's um, they're boxed. There's something quite interesting about an exhibition that or uh, that is uh, on or off. Um, and the next chapter, um, hopefully, is in Japan. I think the first uh, big challenge um, for each version. Radim created a version of his own typeface called uh, Mitim. I think the, the big challenge here is the fact that uh, he's going to have to create more than 26, well, 52, or I mean, even 20, 256 characters, whatever the number is for any serious typographer, uh, will be challenged by the fact that uh, the next exhibition will be in Japanese. And as we are not going to send uh, well, learning from Melbourne, and also the fact that it's going to be in the uh, in this. I don't even know how amazing how we got this amazing deal that we can show in the Gedai Art University in Tokyo. But uh, they have this uh, 150 year old gallery um, that is uh, just extraordinary to be able to show in. So we decided that we are not taking anything there, but that we will be working on the sort of educational aspect of the, the exhibition and, uh, and just create this uh, almost single assignment, which is to remake everything for, for October through workshops, which at the moment will be happening uh, online. So in a way, it's a matter of uh, uh, teleportation. Thank you, Maki. <laughs> sure, we'd love to have it in San Francisco. We just have to open up. Um, so if anybody has questions for Maki, 
please enter them into the Q&A and I will uh, ask them to Maki. Maybe I just wanted to add that um, uh, there has been since 2016 uh, an, a, an official uh, dialogue between John and us um, about these um, alternative realities because, uh, well, because I guess we like each other, but also because there is an uh, obvious link to um, the continuous project that you do also have about the all possible futures. And, um, and yes, I think the, they are published in, uh, in small booklets that, are, uh, that come with the exhibition or just after. Or, and, uh, and I think the next one is, I think it's, it's your turn, isn't it? To ask questions, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's my turn. I'm, I'm, I'm delayed, but I'm glad to hear that the show doesn't open till October, so there's a little time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we have some questions. Um, this question is from uh, Chris Hamamoto, and it's uh, the person I work with on my, my project. He says, "How do you how how do you think does the work made in school relate to the type of work featured in what mirror do you want to lick? Work in school often being speculative, from practical assignments to rebrand of a corporate logo to explicitly speculative design." Yes. Um, hi, Chris. Uh, I think in this instance, um, I think we're really interested in the act of translation. But we divided the workshops in the sense that uh, we, we will start by maybe an act of remaking. Um, maybe they, I mean, the, it will be student led, but so they have the choice of which works they, they are more interested in. But uh, if we start with remaking, it's, uh, it's perhaps the materiality of it. Um, but then it goes into translation um, so if you're talking about corporate logos and, um, and speculative design, I guess they are given the, uh, the conceptual description of an existing artifact or artwork from the exhibition, and then they are remaking it. And formally, I guess we are interested in the alternative uh, result and the translation from maybe a description to, to, um, to a form, or sometimes we will show the form uh, if we don't think it's that, uh, in a way, if it's not that, it is important, but if the, the act of translation will happen from this uh, even west to east, I think the, it's not just a language. Um, we, we've learned from the different, different places that there are similar stories, and sometimes it's better to show another artwork that tells the, a very similar story. So in terms of form, it would be completely different, or even uh, author or time. Or, um, but we also want to see how uh, here there is an act of creation. Because the, the, the deal is that they make everything. So it's not even uh, editing down to, you know, from 100 artworks to um, to, I can't remember how many we, we brought to Melbourne, maybe 30, but it's how can we make all of it? Um, I suppose how to be clever. I mean, it's also absolutely fine to fail. It is within the school, so um, it's part of the experimental. Am, am I, uh, did I understand the question? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Chris can post another question if, if you didn't answer the question, but I think you did. Um, I'll keep going. I think um, Adam, which I, I, I'm guessing is Adam Matichek, he says, good morning, Maki. Hi, Adam. Thanks, thanks for another version of uh, what mirror do you want to lick? Is there a plan to archive or document the exhibition at any point? Yes. Um... 
So Adam, uh, Adam, I don't know. I hope this is not secret, but uh, you were one of the co-design, co um, co-curators of the, the biennial, the Brno biennial. Uh, so you do know about this project quite well. Um, there, there is yes. I think um, I think we there, there was a moment when uh, we were in discussion with, uh, about creating a website. So it's it's about archiving, but um, but it feels that archiving is uh, is very often the end of a project. And uh, even though we wanted to finish with uh, Tokyo, uh, we feel that it could go another twenty another four years. Coincidentally, the the four years with the uh, somehow the U.S. elections, but also the, um, the the Olympics, is a rhythm that is very interesting because they. As I said, it's not openly political, but I think there is something about the world and how it changes the perception of the works. Uh, it's it's not the same to 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 see the same same poster, the same book, the same uh, sculpture, uh, which was in Brno and um, and will be in well in Tokyo. It's obvious because it's not the same. But let's say that, um, for instance, I have the feeling uh, we have the feeling that there might not be. Uh, a 2024 Los Angeles Olympics. And because there are so many changes at the moment and that what was for certain maybe no longer is. Uh, in fact, in Melbourne, we, we had a, a bit of a public, um, there was a talk about it. And it's the first time that I realized that, you know, the alternative realities in the movies or, or even from our perspective of this exhibition, we always thought of alternative uh, realities, let's say of someone else, but that we are the main strand. I think the world has gone in such a way that now I'm almost pretty sure that we are the alternative reality. It's, it's, um, it's like in a movie realizing that uh, you are in fact the clone, not the original. It's terrifying. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question in between just because it seems relevant. Can you can you mention about how you kind of um, because the world is so surreal right now, if um, if you're able to find sort of works by coincidence that you want to include in the show? I mean, I wonder if I know you wanted this sweatshirt for um, Kanye for president and is that like a piece that will be in a future show or how are you kind of being opportunistic yeah. about what's happening? I think definitely. Um, I did want to be sensitive about it and that's why I'm not wearing it now. Um, and by the way, I really want to uh, thank you for um, for buying it because the it is actually a gesture that goes beyond the fact that it can go into an exhibition or not. Um, for me, being in London, I couldn't buy that, uh, you know, as a as a non-US citizen. But um, but even to go further, I I wanted to buy an um, AOC T-shirt, which in a way is totally that's totally fine, I guess, because you know we I, she, she's uh, she's amazing. But we also, as a, for the exhibition, we were interested in buying a, a coloring book by Trump. And I think, uh, I think we asked you, and we were not so sure, but I also asked a friend in New York and, uh, and he just said, I, I will not do this. Because, and I, I really understand that we, we stepped a little bit too far here in uh, something that yeah, looking at it from the perspective of an exhibition, and, and you would uh, you use the word opportunistic? Yes, exactly. That was a little bit. That's too far. Um, somehow, yeah, I think for, for us we we mention maybe those events in the you know in the press release or something like. That. But um, and weirdly, there are uh, maybe the time also heals some. It's not that it healed, but. We, we realized that a lot of the, the artworks in the, not a lot, but let's say five or six, actually um, find its source uh, during the Second World War. 
and um, and you know from contemporary artists to Philip K. Dick to to uh, non-American authors or artists, and uh, so so in essence the the Nazis are you know still the bad guys, and of course there is no prescription for this, but I think our point wasn't to be uh, anti antifa or anti Nazis or anti. It, it's uh, we are more interested in this uh, in the fiction itself. It just seems that the fiction uh, is uh, in, you know increasingly embedded in uh, the first time we showed the exhibition, no one uh, or the press didn't talk about fake news. In France, it was only about this. I think the um, uh, what what we meant by alternative realities were where it was not alternative facts. It was about, I think, the power of art and design to create, uh, you know, um, a foot in the door of another place, not necessarily utopian, but uh, uh, but another place. So, so that went a little bit uh, upside down in that. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. I'm going to keep going with um, David Senior. Asks, um, could you talk? yourself into the idea that the show getting clothes in Melbourne without people seeing it lets those projects still exist in another place, not really in this place. Yep. I mean, the, there were 16 people which, uh, um, which we liked very much in a way because um, I hope this doesn't, it's not going to sound too immodest, but um, we always thought of this uh, Manchester Hall um, mythical uh, concert by the Sex Pistols in 77. I mean, I wasn't there, but, um, but apparently more than 2000 people, uh, you know, identified people, people uh, in the music industry claimed that they, they were there, but uh, the reality is that there were only 17 people. So, you know, it's, it's the fact that uh, stories travel in the, so it's it's not in, not comparable, of course, in terms in the, in the I'm, I'm not saying that it's as important, but um, somehow the, the story, I, 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 in a way, I like the fact that we put all this effort into an exhibition that only 16 people saw. Because I can tell you about this. What was the question? Sorry. Uh, yes, yes. Ah, okay, but maybe further than this, I think that's why I showed the um, the artworks being packed because this is also uh, another realization that uh, most works, artworks, or design or exhibitions are um, in the scope of you know time. Uh, they are more often not artworks being exhibited. So maybe that's uh, that's another big question that we we can uh, we can ask ourselves. Um, and also of what what are they you know at the moment the you, i think you you used uh, an image that sophie maybe gave you or i gave you the um, of the uh, of the main sculpture that al also the crates for the show and they are at the moment in a garden and they and because they're in a garden that that's where those crates are supposed to be in a, to to have up you know thirty five kilo or five hundred kilos of apples in each one of them, and um, and the you know the status of those objects change very quickly. It's uh, you know one day it's a Dan Flavin uh, artworks and uh, and then uh, the next it's uh, just neons stored. Here's the next question by Antonio Palacios. It's so those exhibition consist of fixed pieces, but also itinerant pieces depending on the location. Could it be said to cater to the local taste? Yes, it's um, it is to cater, but uh, usually it is um, in a way to keep things uh, exciting for us as well. So we associate ourselves with, uh, with uh, another co-curator. I mean, you know, how many curators do we need to change the bulb here? But the, um, it is the discussions that come with the, the fact that we associate ourselves with the co-curator who is local and brings, um, at the moment, 
I think it, it, it brings general, um, the general flavor of the country, but also of the, uh, of the place itself. I think the, if the show had been in Paris, it would be very different than being in Nice, because it has a very, very different history, and also the history of the art center itself. And um, so it caters to ourselves. And, you know the the artworks you 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 would still need as a as a member of the audience a very similar amount of effort to to you know to to think about them or to reflect uh, so it's so you know the to cater is yeah I don't know it's not so much a service. But it's more the, the the fun for us of discovery and uh, maybe sharing research about the the notions with someone who's maybe already you know interested uh, um, uh, locally. Also, it's interesting that this show is like a sequel, is a continuous sequel, and in kind of context specific based on where it where it's going, where it's located at the time. Yeah. Um, the next question is, I'm curious, it's from Yifan, and it's, I am curious why it's called licking the mirror. Is there a cultural metaphor embedded? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think I was able to explain this uh, a few years ago, but I lost the, I lost that ability. And, you know, th there is definitely something about reflection that's, quite obvious. Now I have come to think that um, there are more than one, uh, I think, yeah, which mirror do you want to lick? Um, for a while, I thought there are only two. So you, you choose between two, but it's not true. It's more the, um, it's more this hall of mirror in those seventies movies. And at some point, you're not sure which one is the one you're in or that you're looking at, uh, you know, you're looking at yourself. But, um, but in those movies, you, the, the, the cop looks at someone else who then is reflected. So I guess it, it, it's, it becomes more complex as it goes, which I guess is, uh, is our, we never aimed at uh, trying to understand uh, or, or answering the question. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. And so the next one's from Beth and it says, thank you, Maki. Here are a few questions that are related. What do you make of exhibition design during the pandemic and post pandemic? How do you think the pandemic affected the way you're thinking about this exhibition? Did you have any interest in translating the exhibition into virtual space? Uh, yes, the, I suppose we all had to, anyone in, in, involved in uh, exhibition making or um, even, even you know, from a graphic designer's point of view of uh, producing maybe the communication for, we all had to, to rethink, um, not just to adapt, but also to, to go further and then maybe think of, um, of uh, alternative ways. Um, I think these are not really new. I think the pandemic uh, forced us to think about this, but, and I, and I hope I, I don't sound as if I'm, uh, you know, coming after the fact and saying, ha ha, but I think a lot of people were already interested in how, um, in terms of the hierarchy in art and design, um, the exhibition is somehow at, uh, in general, at the top of the hierarchy of what is important. Let's say an art center without, with a big program, uh, educational program and mediation program, and no uh, exhibition program. I can't quite see. Uh, I don't think I've come across this. But um, but now that we were, you know, stripped of the the most of the time of the the experience of the exhibition. 
then the question is, but how do we experience um, art or how, I mean, how do we experience exhibition? We, we definitely have to think of different ways. Here in terms of a pandemic, the, um, the reason why we are proposing the, the remake, sure, coincidentally, it's about translation. Coincidentally, it's about uh, education because it's a school. But we already had um, asked ourselves, but having the budget to, to move a whole container uh, from one place to another, that's great, but is it, you know, is it not a little bit problematic? And, as, and it's not really just the pandemic. The pandemic just made it obvious. Uh, but, you know, before that, we, we were, I guess, uh, all wondering ourselves. I myself was uh, uh, not always flying, but traveling between 20 and 26 weeks per year which is, it's huge, it's half of my time. And I hope that it's wor it was worth it, or at least I was trying to make it worth worthwhile for myself, but, um, but not really. I mean, I couldn't justify that. It's, uh... So maybe it's the same with exhibitions. Yes, we have to, but the digital, to come back to the, to the it's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, we removed our, ourselves or our traveling to Japan for the exhibition, but we don't, we want the object to actually exist. I mean, the prints, the, the, the things, so that at least the people who are in Tokyo or you know, whoever can travel to the exhibition, what they will see are actual objects. And um, so the question of the digital, Yes, it's it's uh, it's it's difficult for for us at the moment to. I mean, does it? Maybe it's the same question as the archiving because the archiving, um, we thought, what do we archive? Is it a digital version, or are the conceptual aspect of those works more important and therefore could uh, fit on uh, you know in one uh, word document? But what do we do with the with the artworks? Um, themselves or the object. That's why the, um, there is a hint um, with, the, with the library, we, we thought, okay, that, that's, an, <laughs> that's a, a small solution of having a permanent exhibition that can be you know, installed by anyone with, a, with a, a little bit of time and interest in, uh, in books. So okay. no answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks so much, Maki. We're out of time. Uh, there are so many questions tonight, so I'm sorry that we didn't answer all of them. But um, thank you so much for being with us and for staying up so late. We really appreciate it. It was a wonderful talk, and we hope to see you uh, in San Francisco soon again. Yes, it's a pleasure. And if you want to send me the emails uh, by email, the questions, I will definitely take my the time to to answer them. So. If anyone wants to, I, I can't guarantee that it's a good answer, but I will answer them. That's great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Maki. And thank you, everybody, for um, coming tonight. We uh, really appreciate it and hope you um, tune in and come to our next Design Division lecture. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Maki. Thank you. See you soon. <laughs> In real life. <laughs>